the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. On the morning of May 7, 1945, Germany surrendered, effectively ending World War II in Europe. However, thousands of German military personnel were still left scattered throughout the world. During the war, Germany had developed many advanced technologies, including the V-1 flying bomb, the V-2 rocket, and the Messerschmitt 262 jet fighter. These advancements were kept highly secret, but now that Germany had fallen, they were up for grabs. Germany had already been split into three zones of post-war control during the Yalta Conference a couple months before the war ended. This meant that American, Soviet, and English intelligence teams were racing to retrieve as much precious equipment as they could before the division took place. Though America was trying to recover equipment and weapons, the most important of all were the Nazi scientists. The Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, JIOA for short, was directly responsible for Operation Paperclip, a campaign to get these scientists away from the Soviets so they could work for us in the looming Cold War. However, in order to gain the upper hand, war criminals were never tried, but instead swiftly integrated into the newly formed military-industrial complex. Even some convicted criminals were hired. This raises an important question. Did the integration of Nazis into Cold War America cause an ideological contamination of government? In June of 1944, Allied forces commenced an attack on German-occupied France. As American troops pushed back the German lines, small groups of intelligence officers known as T-forces followed. The T-forces' objective was to gather up German technology, research materials, and technicians and bring them back for evaluation. It soon became apparent, however, that in order to completely understand this new technology, the brains that developed it would be needed as well but the president flatly refused to sign any papers that would allow such operations. Fearing that without these scientists, the U.S. would be fatally crippled in the upcoming conflict with Russia, the Joint Chiefs of Staff overlooked FDR's refusal. This might have eventually become a problem had it not been for FDR's death on April 12, 1945. Truman was now in control of the White House and, taken completely by surprise and not having been briefed about the growing problems with Soviet Russia during his few weeks as vice president, was in no position to seize the reins of government. With the Cold War imminent, the Joint Chiefs of Staff decided to ask the newly appointed President Truman to expand Operation Overcast. It worked out, and in August of 1945, President Truman authorized Operation Paperclip. The Joint Intelligence Committee, which was the intelligence branch of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, set up its own subcommittee, the JIOA, created for the sole purpose of directing Operation Paperclip with the Exploitation Branch under Army Intelligence and the War Department General Staff in charge of the physical execution of the project. Through this tangled web of sister agencies and subcommittees, the government was able to effectively hide, twist, and erase many parts of these Nazi scientists' pasts. So, though President Truman had expressed his concerns of having Nazis work in the USA, much as Roosevelt did, there was no way he would be able to verify anything these agencies did. The hunt for Nazi scientists now had official sanction. Werner von Braun was arguably the highest profile scientist to be brought from Germany under Operation Paperclip. During World War II, von Braun had worked for the German army developing the V-2 rocket, which the US realized had great potential if coupled with their newly perfected atom bomb. Though he was initially labeled as a security risk, the Office of the Military Government United States, the body responsible for post-war occupation of Germany, found it hard to reach a conclusion about von Braun. The areas where he had worked were now under Soviet control, and the Americans could not find hard evidence one way or another. Though they did know that the Dora concentration camp was the sole source of labor for the V2 factory Mittelwerk, there was no evidence directly linking him to it. Von Braun has since gone to start the space program in conjunction with NASA. He was the chief architect of the Saturn V launch vehicle, 
and his work on rockets led to the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station. However, some people disagree that he is an American hero. Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. Comedian Tom Lehrer wrote a song about von Braun's questionable past, and I Aim for the Stars, a movie about Werner von Braun, is hardly ever mentioned without satirist Mort Sal's proposed subtitle, but sometimes I hit London. Arthur Rudolph, on the other hand, is a different story. He was Mittelweg's production director from 1934 to 1945, and was in charge of the Prisoner Labor Supply Office. This meant that he was directly responsible for not only the number of workers in the factories, but also their conditions. He controlled the hours, the food and drink, and, though less directly, the treatment of the prisoners by his subordinates. At first this information was pushed aside, but it eventually caught up with him when in 1984, already happily retired, he received a visit by the Office of Special Investigations. Over the past couple of years, they had been gathering information about his war crimes after Elie Rosenbaum, a Harvard Law student, tipped them off. After admitting to the utilization of slave labor but not wanting to face trial, Arthur Rudolph renounced his U.S. citizenship and left the country for Germany. But America didn't only bring engineers from Germany. Many doctors were sent to the U.S. as well. Hermann becker freising was a doctor who joined the Nazi party in 1933. He worked for the Luftwaffe on projects dedicated to helping pilots survive in cases of aircraft malfunction and open sea crashes. He worked in the Medical Experimental and Instruction Division of the Aviation Medicine Research Institute. On May 19, 1944, Hermann becker freising attended a conference concerning the potability of seawater. He and another scientist, Schaefer, represented the Chief of Medical Service of the Luftwaffe. In his closing statement at the conference, Becker Freising expressed his concerns that the experiments were not conducted at realistic enough conditions of sea distress and needed to be tested to a greater extent. Because such experiments would likely result in death, using volunteers was out of the question. Instead, Dachau concentration camp inmates were used. Becker Freising later assisted in carrying out the experiments. Because of this, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for crimes against humanity at Nuremberg, though he later appealed and his sentence was commuted to 10 years. After serving his time, Becca Freising was transported under Operation Paperclip to the U.S. and worked for the Army in Texas. In 1947, at the doctor's trial at Nuremberg, Kurt Blome, the chief of research on bacteriological warfare in Germany during World War II, was accused of being responsible for experiments on involuntary human subjects and, quote, the murder and mistreatment of tens of thousands of Polish nationals. The human experiments with plague vaccines and various bacteria Bloma carried out at the Dachau concentration camp were well known of and documented, but under U.S. pressure, Bloma was acquitted. Two months later, he was moved to the United States after the JIOA hit any records that mentioned the Nuremberg trials or his war crimes. In 1951, Bloma signed papers agreeing to work for the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. Each one of the scientists had something to contribute to their respective fields. But how does one weigh the benefits? These people were once Nazis, which must somehow have carried over to their work later on in life. Some of them were even convicted as war criminals. The U.S. government then employed them and simply hid their Nazi past from the public. The government certainly still has this power to manipulate history. In 1998, the Senate passed the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act. The act declared that Nazi war criminal records should not be protected any longer by the government. However, most of the Disclosure Act is simply a list of possible reasons for exemption, and so many records remain undisclosed to the public. In the case of Operation Paperclip, key government agencies made decisions concerning the greater public good. They decided which war criminals were worth bringing into the country without any real checks on what they were doing. This moral hazard still exists now, and even to a greater extent, for we live in a time of secret prisons and the suspension of habeas corpus. But it is still a government for the people, by the people, and it shall not perish from this earth. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes.